Hi, everybody. We are getting ready to have our volunteer meeting today. I still have some volunteers coming in, but I want to let you know that if you're watching this live with us here, I will be putting this on Optima for you. Gracie, yes, you'll be getting credit for this. <laughs> and then if you're watching the recording, make sure you put it in Optima so that you can get continuing education credit for it. So I'd like to introduce Gracie. Gracie works at the Purple Door. She is the area educator. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I am an educator who just covers the whole entire coastal bend right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to let you introduce yourself and go ahead and get started with your presentation. We're happy to have you. Okay. Is there a way for me to share the screen? I absolutely can. You okay. should be able to do Okay. Let me go ahead and share the screen. Okay, everyone. Hi. So like what Nicole said, uh, I am an educator for the Purple Door. So a little bit of my background. I have been working with the Purple Door for the past four years now. I used to be a case manager, meaning I used to work directly with clients. So if you guys have any questions about our services, I can give you a little bit more in-depth detail what our case managers do. Um, but just recently, I want to say a month or two ago, I just switched to education. Now, Ella over here, um, she is the Kingsville advocate. So she covers Claver County. Um, but we also have someone for Jim Wells and Brooks. Um, so I want to come here, talk a little bit briefly about domestic violence and what it looks like. A lot of it a lot of people think it's just like relationship issues. A lot of it, people think, oh, it's just, you know, the physical abuse. But domestic violence has a lot of multiple layers into it um, that we're going to, you know, talk about each layer and how it looks like in the surface of that layer. Because in reality, whenever we get domestic violence cases, we're just like, what? Because <laughs> oftentimes domestic violence is stemmed from one person's wanting to have power and control over another person, just completely individual. Um, yes, it is often stemmed from people who are in intimate relationships, but we have had cousins, we've had had, you know, son to mom or mom to son. It's just anyone who's in a domestic situation it doesn't have to be someone who's an intimate partner. So we're going to briefly go over the power control wheel and we're going to talk about, you know, different methods that they use to keep that person in that situation. Um, I will say a uh, trigger warning. I will talk a lot about violence and I will talk a little bit about sexual violence as well. So if something makes you feel uncomfortable, please step away or, you know, turn out the Zoom, whatever makes you guys feel the most comfortable. OK, so we're going to talk about each layer so the first one we're going to talk about is coercion and threats so basically making or carrying out threats to hurt the victim threatening to leave to commit suicide to report them to welfare uh, making them drop charges and making them do illegal things i have worked with clients who basically they got them addicted to drugs and from there they became their main supplier they have them, you know, constantly going back because they, they're they addicted. They need that drug. And, you know, since their abuser has that for them, they don't want to leave or they can't leave because, you know, they don't know what other resources they can to kind of help them with the withdrawals, right? Uh, we see a lot of them drop charges all the time, whether it's false promises of like, oh, you know, um, if we get back together, um, things will get better. Um, we'll try to work things out. Or I've seen it in the opposite end of the spectrum, which is like drop charges or you never get to see your kids again. Drop charges or you are get it worse. Um, they use all these kinds of threads to kind of make them install that fear into them to make sure that they get what they want, right? To make sure that they have that complete power and control over the other person. Um, to report them to welfare, I've seen a lot of abusers abuse systems. Uh, I've seen uh, abusers constantly calling CPS on them, telling them, well, they're doing drugs. Um, they are not taking care of the kids. They're medically negligent. Just trying to do whatever they can to maintain that power and control for that person, right? Um, there's also intimidation. So looking using looks 
actions, gestures to make them feel afraid, smashing things, destroying the property, um, punching holes in the wall, throwing dishes at them. Um, abusing pets is a big one. Oftentimes, um, if they abuse an animal, the person who's going through that domestic abuse is more likely to be a victim of homicide, right? And then displaying weapons. It can be any manner. Um, I had a young lady tell me one time that he had a gun. One time she came home late from work and he was angry, but he was cool. He was calm and he had the gun pointed at her. And every time she moved, he will slowly point that gun to wherever she was moving while he was completely calm. And it was the imitation, like uh, intimidation factor, right? He was just using that to make sure that she was scared, right? Um, so there's also isolation, making sure that they have no support system whatsoever, right? Controlling what they do, who they see, who they talk to, what they read, where they go, limiting any outside involvement, whether it's no more school, no more work, you know, no more hanging out with your friends, or even no more hanging out with your family. Because if you're talking to your family, you know, that means whatever they're doing to hurt that person will get out and they might lose that control over that individual, right? Using jealousy to justify any action they have. Well, you know, you're always with your mom and, you know, I'm your partner. I'm the person you're supposed to be with. Why are you hanging out with your mom all the time? Who's more important, me or your mom? Or I see that your sister's talking all this smack about you. I don't think she has you in the best interest. Just using whatever they can to make sure that they're isolated. Um, one time a girl was like, oh, yeah, he promised that I didn't need to get a job. I didn't need to drive because he'll be driving me everywhere. Um, I didn't need to work because he will be providing for me. And I didn't need to further my education because he said that he will further his and he'll be supporting me 100%. I just need to be there for him and I can just basically get anything that I want. And that wasn't the case. Those were kind of like false like promises to make sure that she didn't do anything to become somebody who's independent. There's also emotional abuse, putting the victim down, making them feel bad about themselves, name calling, playing mind games, humiliation, making them feel guilty. Um, oftentimes I see them, well, you're a horrible mother. You like no mother should be um out and about while their kids are at home, humiliating them in front of peers and family. Oh, uh, remember that one time where you trip and fell when you were doing the dishes? That was so funny, right? In front of the family and they're all just laughing at the person and they're just like feeling like less of themselves, right? Name calling. You're ugly. Nobody wants you. Um, you're lucky that I even want you. The whole point is to bring them completely down to make them think that they cannot do better than what they have at the moment, right? bringing them completely down so they don't have a voice to speak up for themselves. They don't have any, you know, willpower anymore. And there's in that kind of like standstill and completely dependent on that partner, right? There's also gaslighting. So gaslighting is basically a tactic that a lot of people do to lead to confusion, first loss of confidence, um for you know complete dependency well I didn't do that or you know you're completely wrong I never said that you're completely crazy um just basically just making the person feel like they're at their own fault or they're making up things right it's just essentially quote-unquote making you feel like you're going crazy right if um Emma and I are having a conversation, right? And she's just like, Gracie, remember that time you said that you will help me? I was like, I never said I will help you. Ella, you're crazy. Like, did you have a dream or something? Are you making up lies? Because I never said that. And Ella's just like, I could have sworn you said that that one time. And I'm just like, no, Ella, like, you're done. Like, no, you're not done. <laughs> but <laughs> just kind of like um, making them feel super insecure and to even question themselves because that's the goal, right? 
There is minimizing, denying, and blaming, which is basically the whole entire highlight of gaslighting. So making light of the abuse, taking um, it not serious, like, oh, yeah, it was just a light shove. Like, you're being dramatic. That wasn't nothing. I've seen, like, people push each other harder than that. You're just being overly dramatic, right? Saying that the abuse didn't happen, that wasn't me. I it didn't happen that bruise you probably trip and fell on your own and no that's not that didn't that didn't happen right shifting the responsibility of the abusive behavior well if you would have cleaned the house on time I would have not gotten mad and hit you like that right um and saying that they caused it well you know you're always so clumsy you're so reckless you never think about anyone else like it's your fault that all of this happened right so not taking any accountability of it at all, right? There is using children, and unfortunately children are one of the biggest victims of domestic violence. Um, they make them feel guilty about the children. Well, you're a horrible mom. If you would have been a good mom, maybe CPS would have never been called and they would have never been taken away from you, right? Um, using the children to relay messages. Who's your mom talking to? What is she doing? Who is she with? Tell your mom I said this. Well, your mom's not a good mom. And just basically using that emotional factor for the kids to feel less of a parent, right? Using visitations to harass them. Um, just this morning, we had a client who was saying that, you know, their custody orders were arranged and they were using that to try to get an upper hand and saying, well, you know, it's court ordered that this is this, uh, meet me at my house so you can pick up the kids there. And she's like, that's not in the court order. It's not meet me at the house. And they meet them there in the place that they're supposed to meet and they just harass them all the way, right? Threatening to take away the children, whether it be, you know, well, if you don't listen to me, I'm going to go ahead and tell CPS you're doing drugs and they're going to take the kids away. Or I'm going to file for custody. And you're never going to see the kids. We're going to terminate your rights. And it's scary going through this because oftentimes the legal system is so like scary. Like the parent doesn't know what they can legally do or not. So they get scared and they give in to the fear because they want to stay with their kids. You know, I know for me, <laughs> if somebody threatens me with a big old attorney, I'm just like, I don't know what to do, right? So imagine the people that are going through these situations with an abusive partner saying they're going to take away all their kids and all their rights, you know? What else is they going to do besides listen to what they say to make sure that they have their children, right? So there's also male privilege, but in reality, I like to say any kind of privilege. So when it comes to male privilege, um, and the reason why male privilege is here is because statistically, most people that go through domestic violence are female. Uh, but, you know, treating the victim as a servant, making the big decisions, acting like the master of the castle, being the one to define men's and women's roles. There's also like social economic privilege, where it's just like they know law enforcement. They know all these people. They have the proper connections. So when something happens to the victim, they're just like, who do I talk to? Law enforcement is like his best friend. I can't, you know, go ahead and make that police report. And that's happened quite a few times with some of the clients that I worked with. Um, there's also kind of like, I've seen some male victims as well. And there's, you know, that saying it's just like a man should never hit that woman, like hit a woman. So like I've seen men who also get severely abused with that kind of like mentality as well. So there's multiple kinds of privileges. There's also people who, you know, are part of the LGBTQ community, but they're not out yet. And they have a partner that threatened to out them. Um, so there's kind of different layers of different privileges for people who are going through domestic violence. So there's also economic abuse, which is... A lot of people don't realize happened to them unless like they put it like see in front of them. Um, so it can be, you know, preventing them from getting or keeping a job. I've also seen on the opposite side where they have a job and the other person grabs their financials like right away. They have access to their bank accounts. They instantly withdraw all the money. They keep it for themselves, um, not letting them know or have access to family income. I see this in tax season as well when they claim um, children for dependents and they keep all that money that they um, claimed. 
making them ask for money, giving them an allowance, and then taking money out of their bank accounts. I had this young lady, she was just like, she was on disability. Um, and she was just telling me, well, you know, he never physically abuses me. Um, but, you know, CPSA, I'm going through domestic violence, but I don't see it. So when we hit this portion, she was just like, well, you know, he's so financially responsible. He like looks at my check. He always asks me what I'm going to spend my money on. And he makes sure that I budget my money correctly. And then she kind of thought about it. She's like, well, then he spends my check. And then he gets a check too, but I'm never allowed to touch it. And I'm just like, well, do you have access to your records and all that stuff? She's like, no, he has all the paperwork. And I'm just like, well, you, you know, honey, you're going through this economic abuse. And she kind of just sat there. She's just like, oh, okay. But, you know, they think that our part, like their partner has their best interest at heart. So they're doing these things, but in reality, like I said, it's all manipulation to keep that power and control over that individual, right? There's also monitoring and digital abuse. So we are in 2023. There's social media is a big thing. Everyone has a cell phone. Everyone has a touchscreen device. Um, so digital abuse is a big thing that happens nowadays. So continually checking who they're like where they are, who they're with. I've seen, if you have an iPhone, there's like um, uh, find my device and you can share your location and you can track everyone's location that you share your location with there. There's also like Live360, which I know a lot of parents use with their children. Uh, but we've also seen that where, you know, abusers use that to keep track of where their partner is at. Um, and with Live360, you can tell when they have their location off, you get notifications when they leave home, you get notifications when they reach work. So it's just a whole entire thing to monitor where they're at. So getting angry when they don't respond to texts or calls immediately. So they constantly bombard their phones with messages and text messages all the time. Um, demanding online passwords to all social media accounts and then going through their phones constantly. Um there's cyber stalking as well. So like I said, unwanted phone calls, text message, um, voicemails, anything um, that may or not may or may not be threatening. So creating fake profiles to kind of keep track of who they are, who they're talking to. So clients, if they like block them, you know, they make fake profiles to go ahead and look for them again and try to figure out who they're following. Um, I know I had this lady tell me that she had blocked him, but then he created a fake profile and saw all the friends that she had and added everyone but her to kind of keep track who she's talking to or who she may or may not know. Um, posting messages or images of the person on social media or discussion groups. Um, I've had seen like their posting a lot of revenge porn on social media uh i see people you know posting like facebook has like a lot of drama i know like there's like pages i know kingsville has like a lot of pages and you see those people that post like uh my baby mama never lets me see my kids and they post like messages and pictures and screenshots to give their perspective of the story to try to make the other person look bad right and then hacking into their social media emails and all other accounts so um if you hack into people's google accounts you can basically see everything that they have there their location um because google themselves have like a find my phone thing so if you log into someone's google account you can see you know the emails they're getting the locations they have i know some android phones you can also see their messages that they're receiving so there's a lot of things in layers and layers so like as soon as you get that one email you can log into all these different things. You can reset passwords to their social media. So you can lock them out of that social media and just kind of use that as leverage. I know one girl, she said that she got kicked out of her Facebook and he was intimidated, like pretending to be her 
So for when it came to court, he used screenshots of those posts that he posted on Facebook that weren't even her, but it looked like her to use it against her, if that makes sense. So basically kicking her out, posting stuff, like very negative stuff, and then him taking screenshots of those posts to kind of like take advantage of the situation. Um... So, like I said, GPS advice, by there's also spyware, too, um, that they install into phones, and you have access to everything on their phone. You can have access to all their apps that they're having and the messages in those apps. They have access to um, their text messages, their photos, their location, just anything that they have on that phone, they have complete access to. And normally those spywares, you can honestly install them anywhere. There's They're in the Google App Store. You just have to pay like a monthly subscription. Um, and if the perpetrator had access to the phone once, you know, who knows if they installed it or not, right? And it's really hard to kind of get by and show this as evidence to police because especially in the rural areas, they don't have much expertise on that. So the biggest thing I always heard was just like, my phone's been hacked. I don't know how, I don't know what, but he like got into my phone and he could see everything. He could see my location. And it could be that they installed some kind of application to get access of all of those stuff. So even monitoring their purchases, um, Amazon accounts, Google Maps, one way or another, they will find a way. Uh, I remember seeing a, a tweet that said, like, I blocked him in all my social media accounts, yet he, he messaged me on Cash App or Venmo. Just kind of finding different ways to kind of just, like, figuring out how to get in contact with that person because the last thing they want to do is lose that power and control. So they will try whatever tactic that they can to make sure that they have that contact with them. So that is a video that we will not be going through today just for time's sakes. So there's also sexual and intimate abuse. So any sexual activity that happens without willingly active or impaired consent and then behaviors um, that use words to attack the victim's sexuality. I've seen intimate abuse with basically the whole entire power and control wheel. I remember, I'm sorry? Oh, okay. So basically I've seen um, a lot of clients that kept keep on getting pregnant because that's what they do. That's like the next slide. Um, reproductive abuse, so forcing them to get off birth control, sabotaging uh, birth control methods, so uh, hiding or destroying contraceptives, um, tampering with them, stealthing. Stealthing is basically when um, they decide to go in with condom first, but then they remove it while they said that they're still using protection, uh, refusing to withdraw during sex. Um, so I've seen people who can, like I said, continually can't keep on getting pregnant because that's part of the whole entire power and control. They think the more kids that they have with me, the less likely they are going to leave me. I've also seen where um, they have kids with the economic abuse. They, she's not working. She's not getting any kind of like assistance or whatsoever. So in order for her to get items for the children, she has to keep on performing sexually in order for her babies to get fed so they do these different types of tactics to ensure that this person stays in a relationship and then there's also physical abuse so any intention of use of physical force with the intent to cause fear or injury so that can be pushing shoving kicking threatening um pulling hair breaking items holding them down and then strangulation um, so do you guys have any questions about the power and control wheel, the tactics, anything? I know it's a lot of like heavy stuff, um, but it's just kind of like the nitty gritty and the reality of the situation of domestic violence. A lot of people just think it's just the physical abuse, the emotional abuse, but in reality, there's multiple layers, um, 
on average, it takes about a person seven times to completely leave the relationship because of all the things that they go on with these situations. So one of the things that I wanted to, to ask, or maybe you could explain a little bit more, just because you're married to somebody or you have children with somebody, they can still rape you. Is that correct? Yes, that is 100% correct. Yeah, as, if there's no consent, doesn't matter if they're a husband, it's still considered rape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my next question is, as CASA volunteers, when we're working with families that are struggling with domestic violence, what are some steps that we can take to assist parents that are that are in this cycle of abuse? So I've had seeing people with good intentions trying to help out people with domestic violence. Uh, I've seen, I remember seeing this one gentleman who wasn't out yet, but he felt pressured by her, his friend to come to the Purple Door and get services. And the whole entire time he was there, he presented it because he wasn't ready yet. So the biggest thing I always want to give people is just like planting that seed, letting them know that they have someone that's there to support them and letting them know that there's services out there. Because if we keep on telling, well, you need to do this, this, and that, the most less likely they feel like they want to do it. The whole entire thing is about empowering them to go get the help. Because at this point, they lost all their power. They don't have any control. So they don't know what they can or can't do yet. And the biggest thing I always tell clients is like, they know their situation. They know what's safe for them. And what we're thinking is just like, we're thinking like, well, just get out. He's abusing you. He's going to do this for you, right? But her, she's like, okay, I know where he's at. I know what he's going to do next. I think it's safer for me to still interact with him at the meanwhile. So I always tell people, it's just like, if you want to help somebody who's going through domestic violence, listen to them fully kind-hearted. And then, you know, if they want to prepare to go for that step, then okay, that's great. You can be there to support. But if they retract and they go back, still be there to support them. Because I know it's very frustrating when you help them and you can see them like starting to get out of the situation. You're like, yes, great for you. But then you see them go back. You're like, oh my gosh, what happened? You could have done this. You could have done that. You know, just being kind in that situation is like, okay, I understand. Is there a reason why you went back? Are you just not ready yet? Because a lot of times they do go back, right? So it's just kind of planting that seed and just being that ear for them. And whenever they're ready, just be there to support them, to help them, you know, make that next step. And do not show any judgment because, you know, it's their situation. They know what's best for them at the moment. They know what's safe for them, what's not safe for them. Um, so just kind of like, just go through the waves with them is what I like to say. Because they will have good days where you see they progress a lot. And then you, you have days where they just kind of regress and they just don't go forward anything. And that's the hard part of domestic violence. It's just like, we don't know yet whether they're ready or not. I have, well, she's not my client anymore, but she just left her abuser after like 25 years of being with him last year. And I'm just like, great for you. But her family have gone through the motion so much that they're like, you're just going to go back with him anyways, right? So it's just kind of like riding through that motion. Um, but yeah, just plant that seed and, and just be supportful. And whenever they're ready to go, just show them that support then. And what, so when they do finally make that step and they decide they want to reach out for assistance, what type of assistance does the Purple Door offer for men and women that are exiting a domestic violence relationship? So we try to help with everything. <laughs> um, we're just kind of like a little resource dictionary to try to figure out where they need to go next, whether it's trying to figure out where they want to move next, um, trying to figure out any legal stuff like custody and stuff like that, custody, divorce. We try to help out with them as well. We also try to help out with, um, oftentimes, their perpetrators keep important documents with them. We do help get back their birth uh, birth certificate and their Texas ID as well. Um, we do a lot of safety planning here because 
when you leave a domestic violence relationship, that's when things tend to escalate because that person's losing power and control. So it's also figuring out safety after leaving the situation. Um, just figuring out what their next steps are. If they're scared that they might have any medical needs, what they have because of the outcome of domestic violence, we can help them that, with that as well. Any civil or criminal court as well, we provide assistance in, whether it's court accompaniment or just figuring out what next steps to do. Um, we also help them do police reporting whenever they're ready to make that police report. We do hospital accompaniments. So if they get raped or sexually assaulted, we do provide assistance to taking them to corpus to get a SANE exam done. So we just try to figure out little, like everything that has to do with the situation. Um, we also do help apply for crime victims compensation, which is a financial reimbursement program to help them get reimbursed uh, for either relocating or um, I had this girl who got reimbursed for storage units that she had because she, he, she lost her home because of the domestic violence. So she put everything in the storage unit and she was able to get those months reimbursed back of what she paid for the storage unit uh, because of the domestic violence. We also help out with, you know, housing as well. Um, there are certain laws too that if they're currently living in an apartment with their abuser and they want to get out, we can help them break their lease without them having any repercussions as well. So there's certain laws in Texas that we can most definitely help with the client to either leave that situation or forget, figure out their next steps. Mm -hmm. So we try to do everything. <laughs> so yeah. And what type of effect does, um... hi, how are you? Sorry. What type of effect does domestic violence in the home have on children that are in the home, in your experience? Okay. So domestic violence is a cycle. So I've seen kids become aggressive, like the aggressor were at the home. I've seen them become timid, um, very scared, very self-conscious, um, so it just depends on the child because not all children have the same effects as they do with another kid, right? So it just depends. I've seen them, like I said, they can either become very aggressive. I've seen kids physically abuse their mom afterwards because they think that's what's normal. I've seen kids who wet the bed a lot because they're scared that dad's going to start come yelling and screaming. And I'm sorry, I keep on saying like, dads are the aggressors and moms are, it's just, like I said, that's what I mainly see. I've seen kids um, not speak for a long time because of the domestic violence situation. It's just, they have a lot of emotional effects, if you get me. Sorry, I'm trying to think in the top of my head. Do you wanna? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, a lot of children, they, they don't always, you think that they'll be the abuser. They could be an abuser later in life or even at that age. Like eventually, like Gracie said, it becomes normal to them. So they can either um, go. There's a lot of ways they can go. They can become a victim later in life. They become they can become the aggressor later in life. Um, and this is doesn't matter what gender they are or anything like that. They can also um, like shut down. They can. Um, just it just shows it's it's different for them it, they may not even be physically abused but that just watching their um parent get a physically abused or emotionally mentally abused by another parent is devastating for a child they they got to figure out if they're going to pick sides and whose side are they going to pick and who's correct and that's very confusing for them so it's a lot of work with kids because um I mean, we don't, we, we have counselors here that also, mm -hmm. um, we send them to counseling if that's part of the, the issue, if that'll help with them. It, it's also goes counseling to the victim. Um, but the children can also see counselors and, um, and that's really important because I think a lot of times they don't like we, you know, we have a client right now that their kids are seeing a lot of everything and, they, and really the, to them, it's normal. They think it's normal because where they're at now, they still see it with their extended family. So um, 
they think it's normal and they don't understand why mom is, is um, not that she's making a big deal about it, but she's trying to protect them and trying to protect herself. And so the decisions that she's making during this is, you know, these kids are questioning it. And, and that's kind of hard because the mom is saying that, oh my goodness, they're, you know, being brainwashed or, you know, what do I do with that? You know, I, how do I work with that? How do I get them without talking bad about the other parent? She's trying mm -hmm. to help them be more, you know, not think that that's normal, but doesn't know how to go about talking to them. And, and that's tough. It's tough as a parent to do that. So, um, Lots, lots of different things can happen. Like mm -hmm. Gracie said, every kid is different. Um, and what they see is different because um, they may not be experiencing any of it, you know, to themselves It's that they're, they're observing it. Yeah. And that is different still than from experiencing it. And I can't tell you which one's worse. Yeah. Cause um, kids are very smart. They, they're like little sponges. They absorb everything that they go through so um I actually was able to pull up like a list that I had from another presentation so you know a lot of nightmares difficulties concentrating um increased aggression or increased anxiety from being separated from one parent uh, I know some kids feel like the needs to protect the parent that are getting abused um and I've also had cases where daughter went to juvie because dad was physically assaulting mom well, stepdad, that she came in and she assaulted him back, right? Uh, intense worry and safety about the parent. They feel a lot of guilt, a lot of shame, a lot of depression. Um, I also went through, saw my parents go through domestic violence growing up, and I thought it was my fault a lot. I used to blame myself because I would see them fighting and I would think it was just something that I did. Was it something that I didn't do? Is it because I didn't get a good grade? So a lot of kids experience a lot of shame and guilt, um, very low self-esteem, poor social, like very introverted. They don't know how to properly socialize with other people because they don't know if other people are going to lash out to them or be aggressive to them. Um, sometimes they get poor grades, they skip school. So it's just the, the effects are very long. And sometimes if kids don't get that proper intervention and help like counseling, it can prolong and continue on to adulthood. Mm -hmm. So I have a question. I You mentioned that you offer counseling services. Is that for children as well? And what other services do you provide that are child specific? So yes, so we provide ch uh, counseling for kids five and up. We do have certain counselors that are specialized in play therapy as well. So they can get those counseling services. Um, we do also have, let's say, when it comes to child abuse cases as well, we do provide case management for them. So um, whether they were ever sexually assaulted or they were just physically abused, we do work with them to figure out what next steps, whether it be any civil cases um, or any criminal cases. Um, it just depends on the child and the situation, but anything that's involved for the parent is any services for the parents, same thing for the child. We provide them that support. We even have peer counseling with them too, if they feel like they need that extra support aside from counseling. Um, I know that before we used to visit children um, to just kind of talk to them and figure out what kind of needs that they want and kind of do safety planning with them individually to figure out what's good with them or not good with them and what they feel safe and not feel safe with. Um, whatever they say in counseling though, we do keep confidential from parents unless it's like something that we have concerns of. So anytime the count they speak with a counselor, kids are everything that they say is going to remain confidential. So mom can ask, what are they saying? Are they what are they talking about? We won't really give them too much information because you know they deserve that confidentiality as well. And are these services on a pay scale or are they free? Our services are 100% free. Um, we don't need no proof or evidence that the person's going through domestic violence. If they just make the outcry, say, hey, I'm going through this or I went through this, we're here to offer them all our services. Yep. All right, I'd like to open it up for questions at this time. I kind of ran through mine. Um, please feel free to type them in the chat. 
if you have any questions. I really love the presentation, Gracie, and I love how it went through all the other different types of abuse and neglect that somebody might not think of right away. And the physical abuse was put at the end because okay. it's true. You hear about domestic violence and you oftentimes think physical abuse, but it's all those other things that reinstill that power and control that also have impact on the folks that are the victims. Yeah. And our clients don't need to also experience physical abuse. We've had clients here that have never been physically hurt at all, but the whole entire wheel was there and it was implemented in the relationship. And it's good that they caught it early because those are like the warning signs that they have before it escalates to that greater abuse. So they don't have to only experience that physical abuse to be a client of ours. They can go through anything in that wheel and we like give them all the proper services that they need. I have a question. Yes. Okay. I heard you speak about the abuse to the parent, to the adult, but I'm wondering, and I don't hear much about this, in the abusive situation, is it typical for the children to be also abused? Oh, yeah. If the parent is going through abuse, is there domestic violence present in the like the household? Then the child is also most likely going to th through some type of abuse, whether it be emotional or mental. Most definitely the child does go through that type of abuse as well. Um, so there is a abuse will for children and I can pull that up real quick. Let me... Let's see. And the abuse for children kind of looks different than the um, power and control wheel, but it's still ultimately the same. Yeah, most likely if the mom is going or the partner is going through type some type of abuse, then the child is experiencing some kind of abuse as well. While you pull that up, I have two questions here in the comments. The first one is, have the court started mandating counseling at the purple door? It's not 100% mandated. Um, the question was from Nancy. Uh, sometimes courts do have mandatory, they require that moms may go and get services from the purple door. And sometimes that abusers might seek batteries inter intervention and prevention program when it was offered. I don't believe that's offered anymore in our area, but um, the children are usually given counseling outside of the purple door. They're usually paired with counselors, um, you know, their own specific counselor, but it can be, the judge can, you know, um, require that parents go and get and seek services. The next question is, is there any information on anybody who commits abuse ever changing? So I will say we do get a lot of referrals from CPS uh, for a lot of parents that are going through domestic violence. I used to also attend FGCs uh, because of this. Now, you guys can also send referrals indirectly if you feel like the parent needs the, um, support. It doesn't need to be a direct referral from CPS. We can get referrals from cost volunteers as well. Um, so if you guys feel like that parent needs the support, please feel free to send us that referral. Um, the thing about our agency, FICPS don't really send too many referrals to us, um, is because we need to release some information in order to give CPS or anyone any information about the parent getting services from us. Um, so I know some CPS workers get a little bit frustrated on that. Um, and I know I've had a couple blow up my phone because I haven't been able to give them any information. But I've had, um, if some people truly believe that they need it, they do send it to us so we can help the client. Um, but like I said, you guys can send the referrals to us and we're more than happy to reach out to the parents to help them out any way that they can. Uh, we do offer parenting classes as well, as well as domestic violence 101 classes. Now those, um, We've had a lot of people send referrals to us so they the parent can complete it for 
whatever was court mandated from them. Cool. So know that we also offer those services as well. And I just want to put it out there that if you're if you're concerned that one of the parents in the or you know the parents that you're working with might be struggling with domestic violence or a victim of domestic violence, please be sure to talk to your supervisor first before sending in any referrals to the depart uh, to the purple door. Make sure that your the supervisor is aware of what uh, of what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, then the next question was: Is there any information on anybody who commits abuse ever changing? Well, I've only been here for four years. I don't want to be somebody that's like a negative Nancy and be like, no, they never change. Um, but I've seen people who, I think of this one particular case. He didn't realize he was being abusive until CPS got involved and they had that intervention. And for him, he did the BIP and... Um, he did everything he needed to do, right? He was more than happy to do it. At the end, he was still doing some of the toxic behaviors, but he was more cautious and he would, you know, slowly, it's like undoing learning behavior that you grew up with. Some people, and it's a very small percentage, are willing to change after knowing that they were wrong. A lot of people that I've seen have not changed and continue to do what's normal for them. So I'm not going to say, no, they don't ever, I've, out of my four years, I've only seen one person, you know, actively wanting to change and, you know, undo the behaviors that he grew up with. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to say it's like, never say never. Like they don't, some people do change, but it's when, whether they're willing to do that change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And did you want to show us the child abuse wheel? It didn't pop up. Sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Yeah. I will send an email because okay. I do have it, but it's just my documents are everywhere right now. No problem. Um, I can send it to you guys um, through email or I'll send it to Nicole to send it to everyone. Yeah. And, I and can would also... you mind, uh, will you please send both the power yeah. control wheel and the child abuse wheel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely. I'll be able to do that. And Anything I'll also go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Gracie. I will say I will also send Ella's information. So if you guys have any more questions and you guys are here in Claiborne County, she's more than willing to answer any questions. We can even answer hypotheticals. Mm -hmm. So if you call us and you're like, hypothetically, if I knew somebody who's going through this and there's court custody, blah, 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 blah. Ella would be like, well, this and this and that, they can try doing these resources. So feel free to call us with questions. We're more than happy to, and willing to answer these questions with what we've seen and experienced. All right, I don't wanna get, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but if you're not able to bring up the wheel, can you just give us off the, are you able, are you allowed to speak off the top of your head? Can you just say the kinds of things that might be there? Okay. So hearing it from you might be more helpful to me to understand it. Okay, yeah. So it's kind of like the reflection of the power and control wheel. So basically, there is the threatening, like how I explained earlier, they threaten their kids to not speak to anyone, not um, tell anyone what's going on in their home, or else they'll take away, you know, I've seen them like take away their animals from them. That's the biggest one I've seen or threaten them to hurt mom or hurt sibling if they don't, you know, keep quiet. There's also using institutions. So basically, um, I'm going to call the police on you and tell them that you're being a bad kid or I'm going to call the schools and let them know that you're misbehaving so you can miss out on days. Um, just kind of using those things against the child to make sure that the child is being obedient and listening to what they're saying. There's also isolation. So they isolate the child from any family or friends. I've seen them isolate them from grandparents a lot when they want to visit their grandparents, but they're just like, no, like you can't talk to anyone. Um, there's also kind of like the financial abuse where it's just kind of like, well, think of it like the hierarchy of needs. I don't know if you guys seen Maslow's hierarchy of needs, taking away basic things from them, food, water, clothing, or not giving them, you know, more like kids grow, right? They grow fast, making them use the same clothing that they have that's worn and torn and just no longer fits them properly. They also embarrass them a lot and they use that embarrassment. Um, 
trying to see what else. Um, I went over institutions. Um, let me look over at the park. And do you think, is this in conjunction with domestic violence that's already going on in the home, or could this be separate? It can also be separate, honestly. Um, it can be, yeah, because, you know, you hear stories of, you know, parents separating from another parent, and they get with, like, a step-parent, and that's their parents very abusive towards the child. So it can be whether domestic violence is present or not present in the home. Um, there's also using adult privilege, so using their adult size to kind of hover over the child to make them feel inferior. Um, and a lot of emotional abuse, too, saying that they won't amount to nothing, they won't do anything good in their lives, just kind of putting those that child down to make sure that they don't speak up and say anything. And then, of course, there's like the physical abuse as well. Just kind of like if you look at the power and control wheel it can still be, even if it's like for an adult, it can still most definitely be implemented for a child. Um, I've heard stories where a 16 year old had to work in order to provide for their parents and they would take all that financials and just spend their check and use none of it on them. So there's different types of ways of um, child abuse as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Would that come on the purple door or somebody or or um or 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 not? I'm sorry. I'm saying that kind of abuse that you described, would that be a purple door domain or is it outside of your you're describing it to me, but do you look at that and do you address those things um as part of the work that you do at Purple Door or this would be other agency affair you'd you'd say we see this but uh, we don't deal with this we deal with it if they have somebody that has the custody over them to be willing to sign them up for services as long as if they're yeah then we can help with them we've had kids who one partner saw or a grandparent take custody over them and they said this is the abuse that the child went through we were more than happy to help with them. Uh, we also help kids who go through teen dating violence as well. Um, we have a hotline where they can remain confidential, even if they're not willing to let their parent know what's going on. We still help them out in giving them information that they need or being that helping here for them to kind of like let go of what's going on. But yes, we do. We also get referrals from the CAC children's advocacy advocacy center and we help those kids out because of the abuse that they go through so as long as they have a guardian who's willing to sign them up for services we can help them out as well okay thank you no that's it those are my questions i have a question yes how much how much of this uh, evidence can you present to the court is it allowed or not allowed from uh, from purple door from the from purple door to the pl client to casa casa to the courts is that a, a, an acceptable procedure or not or is it denied by the courts so if we get subpoenaed then we can give you the evidence that we have here i know mm -hmm. we've had some parents that are very compliant and they request our records and we go ahead and we um you know, give you all the information of the client that worked here. I know I've been subpoenaed before for a client um, to go to talk to court and say, hey, this is what I went through. Now, whether or not it's in the best interest, because our advocates have multiple cases. So remembering one specific case may or may not, it'll be iffy. Because I remember when I was subpoenaed for that one client, it was something that happened three years ago. And I'm just like, I can't remember because it's been three years. I haven't been able to, you know, recall the information correctly. So it didn't really help out in the situation. But what we can suggest you to do is that we have expert witnesses, which is basically somebody who's an expert of domestic violence, come talk in court 
about the dynamics of abuse and why people don't automatically leave. So it's not anything particularly like something that it's not going to be somebody that knows the case, but knows the dynamics of domestic violence and or sexual assaults to kind of show the court why things happen or, you know, why they don't leave right away. So we have that offered for attorneys who want to subpoena one of our expert witnesses to educate the court. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't keep documents. documents. Mm -hmm. So because we don't keep documents, we don't really have that kind of proof to offer that once they get to a lawyer, once we set up that time and get them a lawyer, you know, someone to um, be there with them, they're going to be giving all of that supportive stuff over to them. And so hopefully now there are times, I mean, that's what our job is, is to find them legal help because um, a lot of times they're left alone and having to be their own, like representing themselves. And so if anything, it's to give them, even if they have to represent themselves, they're still talking, right? I would say yeah. still talking to a lawyer, an attorney to help them so they know what to say, what to show, what to do. And, um, but yeah, as far as documents and stuff, they, like they could subpoena us, but we're not going to have those documents because we don't keep them. So like, we do have internal notes, but I will let you know they're very vague. They're very vague. We do not put, talk to this and this person for this blah, 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 because just in case a perpetrator tries to use us against the client, they don't have anything against the client when they're going through us. You get me? So our agency is always for the safety and confidential mm -hmm. confidentiality for the client to make sure that um, a perpetrator doesn't take anything that we have and use it against them as another way of power and control. Wow, Thank, that was a great question, Ms. Pat. Thank you so much for the explanation. Well, Thank this you. has been really eye-opening. I am so grateful to have you guys. And at this time, if there's no further questions, I'm gonna go ahead and call it. And I would love for you to come back and give us more information later on. Yeah. Just let me, you have my number. <laughs> oh, yes, girl. Your number, your email, your everything. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yes. Thank Bye. you.